Hello, my name is Ron Bowen and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, my co-host Joe Stewart and I speak with inspiring movers, thinkers and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I'd like to start by honouring the traditional owners of the unceded land on which this episode was recorded, the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nation. Joe and I pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. In this episode, we speak with UK-based yoga teacher, writer, coach, and body-positive advocate, Donna Noble. This is the second time we've spoken with Donna for the podcast, and that's because she's doing some really amazing work. Donna has just written a new book called Teaching Body Positive Yoga, which is a wonderful resource for all teachers. Whether you label your classes as body positive or not, this book is recommended reading for all teachers who want the skills and resources to facilitate a positive class experience for everyone. The tone is welcoming and informative. Donna keeps it real and kind as she shares about how size, race, body image, and trauma can impact someone's experience in class and how we can support individual needs as teachers. This is vital information for yoga teachers today, yet is sadly lacking from many teacher trainings. Teaching Body Positive Yoga introduces these topics, providing a foundation of knowledge, as well as links to further educational resources from a diverse range of experts. It really is a fantastic resource for new and established teachers, and we were so excited to talk to Donna about the writing process. So let's get into our conversation. All right, well, Donna Noble, uh, it's so good to get the chance to speak with you again. Our last conversation, uh, as we were just talking about before, was in 2019, and so much has changed since then. So I was just wondering if you could catch us up on how things have changed for you and how you're doing today. Well, thank you both for having me. Yeah, so it's been a while, and a lot has changed the world and, and what I've been doing. But since the last time I spoke, I've still been doing the essentially body positivity work. But um, like most people, my, a lot of the work I've done has transitioned online. And I find that I'm actually talking about more and teaching teachers now about diversity and inclusion. But also I have written a book called Teaching Body Positive Yoga. So it's something that was totally unexpected, but something that I'm here to talk to you about this morning. But yeah, very much online and loving online. I didn't realize how much I would, but it's meant that I've been able to reach a, a wider audience and teach to to people all around the world and connect with different people. So it's, it, that's been wonderful. But also slowly but surely now I'm starting to teach in-person classes because I found that's something that I'm very much missing the, you know, the, in, the energy that you get with teaching with, with, with our community. Yeah, and I feel like online is great if you have a calm, quiet house and a good internet connection. But if you don't have those things, people are just really craving being able to get back in the studio and have that experience and I think what it showed me as well is that I I used to teach a lot around London so I think I was out and about and that was that was my world but with the lockdown I began to see that I enjoy my company a lot more and being at home a lot more I've become a lot more homely something that I don't think I'd have seen if we continued in in the same way so so getting back out was not the struggle because of fear but it's like but I'd like being at home, <laughs> you know, I love the fact that I can just switch on Zoom, teach the class and then finish and I can, you know, be washing the dishes or whatever straight after as opposed to traveling, you know, to get back home and having that commute. And so to move into your book, Teaching Body Positive Yoga, just reading it, it's obviously such a labor of love and it really seemed like accumulation of a lot of lessons learned in your training and in your teaching and in your own practice. Would you like to tell us what inspired you to start writing it? Well, Joey, it wasn't something, it, uh, writing a book wasn't on my my list of goals. It was a friend of mine that had written a book, Lindsay Porter. And I think my publishers were looking for potential writers. So they reached out and said, do you know of anyone that may have something interesting to write about? And straight away, she mentioned Donna Noble about body positive yoga. And I didn't take it seriously in the beginning. I thought, yeah, this is going to come to nothing type thing. So we had the conversation. She did, she did the E sort of introduction. And then I was going to a conference and so was the the editor, and said so we could meet there. So we met, and she said, "Well, would you? What would you? What do you think you have to offer in writing a book?" So I outlined basically what I thought I could I could share, and she said, "Yeah, I think we could work on that." And I still didn't believe. I thought she's just 
you should pay lip service to me type thing. So I went away and sat on it for a while. I said, what I think you should do is pitch your idea. So I went away and I just one day sat on it for weeks and I said, okay, I have to do this. I just wrote down anything in terms of what I thought would be valuable in order to, to write about. And they came back and said, yeah, I love it. A few tweaks and these are the chapters, the outline. And I, I got the contract. So it was like, so it was meant to be, but it wasn't something that I had considered or was part of what I thought I would do on during this yoga journey that of mine. And so did the timing line up with the lockdowns as well. Yeah. I was wondering if you started writing a book when you were just at home all alone and you weren't teaching your regular classes. Yeah, I did jokes. I think I got the contract just before lockdown ensued. And then I think they kept chasing me like, oh, no, when is it going to happen? I think I wrote chapter one, the year lockdown actually started. But I sat on it because then obviously dealing with the lockdown and, and, and everything else and trying to transition online, I sat on it and I still don't think I believe that this book was real. And I think it was like last year that I thought, okay, I have to really sit down now and really get on with it. I've been gifted this opportunity. You know, you have something to share. You're trying to get body positivity out there. What a wonderful way to do it. Other than in the book, you, there's only one of me I can't do it on my own. And the book's an excellent way to do that. So I think then I began to realise the the gift that I had there to, to share the knowledge that I, I, I have acquired and my experiences along the way. I think so many people are going to appreciate this book. Like I'm just thinking back to my own teacher training and it was really thorough. Like it was a two-year course and it was over a thousand hours and like that was back in 2005. So I think like it did give me kind of a good grounding about generally making people in class and using language that's not going to make anything anyone feel bad about themselves. But there was really not like trauma-informed language wasn't covered, non-gendered language wasn't really covered, and even just different size, different race, really speaking with anyone who might not have had your own life experience wasn't really articulated in the way that you break it down in your book. Was this your thought when you were writing it to help teachers kind of get up to speed with their knowledge and how they present it since our, like our world has changed? And I think still some teacher trainings haven't caught up. I totally agree with you, Joan. A lot of what you said resonates with me about your training. Mine was similar because often when I was on training, I was the only person of colour on the training itself. So that informed what I want to share. But also I just wanted to make anyone else as a teacher make their life a lot easier so that they had, if they didn't have that exposure, the book would help them to do so. So I, I basically want to share my experiences, but ways in which to make teaching to diverse communities a lot easier so that was very much the intention of the book so sharing what I thought that other teachers would find valuable like language for me is a very key aspect of things and things like when I was a teacher no one talked to me about getting consent about touch you know I, I I just got touched that was it you know full stop so it was like letting teachers be aware because as you say a lot of teacher trainings still don't um trauma-informed and my eyes were so open when I went on these trainings I'm sort of having to unlearn what I've learned and hopefully a lot of that comes through in the book to to make this transition or path for teachers a lot easier. And I guess what are the steps between saying everyone's welcome in my class and actually bringing that into reality and how do we navigate if we do get it wrong sometimes? Yeah but basically you see that a lot um, that you know, you see a description and it says beginners class, say, for instance, and you go to the class and it's not beginners. And it's like, well, what, you know, are you saying it's beginners because it's popular or trendy or you see another thing now, everyone welcome. And, you know, you hear of people's experiences that it's not. So one of the things that I would do to start with is be very careful. And I advise teach of this, your description, is your description very clear? Does it outline what a new person to class can expect? is they're going to be touched. You know, imagine if someone comes into class, I don't know you, Joan, you come, you touch me. You know, are they may or may aware of that. So look at all those things. Also, the imagery that you use as well. Does your imagery convey what someone can expect in class? You, you know, are you showing po postures that are accessible? You know, not someone with their leg behind their head, because that to me doesn't convey a beginner's class. And that puts people off because they're thinking, I'm not flexible. There are so many you know, objections to starting a yoga practice. And the imagery I found for me was so powerful because if it lets somebody think that I can do that, that's that's a very key invitation for somebody. 
but actually, and, and you as a teacher sharing your authentic voice, not sharing just what you've, you've been taught, you know, have you looked at the audience you're trying to, to reach? So how would you go about reaching them? And I think when I spoke to you the last time, that's one thing I didn't know what to do. I, I saw there were certain people that were visible from the yoga space and it's like, well, how can I reach them? You know, where can I go to see what they're into so that I can make yoga, make them see that yoga can help them in some way, shape or form. And then, and that's trying to get them into the yoga space. But once they're there, actually being skilled that you are able to teach to diverse bodies, that you're offered, able to offer variations, that you actually advocate the use of props, you know, also showing, like I sometimes show myself sitting in a chair doing yoga poses so that everyone can see the different ways in which yoga can be done because there's not one way that yoga is practiced or taught. And that's how I say you can get it there. But be your authentic self. And if you come from a place of love, I think, and non-harming, that's how you can show that to your potential community. So I hope that answers your question. Definitely. And I totally get that in your writing as well. Like you're coming from a place of love and from ahimsa. And I love that your tone, it's really more about sharing knowledge so we can all do better rather than kind of shaming anyone if this is new knowledge for them or if it wasn't part of their training. Because I think we've all had that experience. I've definitely had it in, say, an anatomy workshop where you learn something new and you think, oh my gosh, like how many people have I harmed when I was doing this the other way? And I think sometimes teachers can get really touchy about their teaching because it is so close to their hearts. Was this a tricky line for you to tread while you were writing because you're so passionate about these issues and also like you have heard and had some really bad class experiences? (laughs) Yeah, um, I think it is. I think, Joe, I come from a place of collaboration. I feel that if I go in and start hitting someone in the head with what I believe, it's not conducive to, to change. So I try to share in a way that so I, I get people to think about what it is they're doing. And I think that's more impactful than me dictating that it should be done this way. Because I, I never had that. The, my teachers allowed me to question myself, but in a way that was derogatory, but in a way that what felt right for me in terms of what I shared. And that's the way I come across. And even like, it, it can be difficult, even, you know, talking about race and, and lack of diversity. But in order to get people on board, I find on board the way that I, I, I talk about it and share has been very impactful. And it works for me. And so that's why I do that. And I, and I find people are receptive. And I've also found even the way I share, even when I teach on teacher training courses, that the, the owner will come back and say, you know, the, the, uh, even like last week, I got a compliment saying that the new trainees are taking your energy and your teachings. And that's what I want. Not that, oh, they came away and they just, they were confused or lost and they learned nothing. But it's about making them see. And I, and I, and, and it's how, I, how can I make the most impact that they are able to see what I'm trying to convey? It's not about me. It's about what they can learn or hear that I say or show them that will make them take what I, I, I've shared into their teachings to make the yoga. Yeah. Definitely. Like you get the sense that like you're welcoming people into a whole community of like different voices and different opinions. And while there are some things that really only work for a minority of people, so we want to move away from that type of teaching and language, there is no perfect way of expressing something that's going to work for everyone. So to kind of open that up and kind of get th- people thinking about the why rather than fixating on like a really dogmatic point of view is really powerful. Yeah, and I've seen where I've gone to trainings myself where it has been quite dogmatic and I've seen how people's back get up because people get defensive because they think you're accusing them and it's not like that at all you know, and that we all do make mistakes, but it's how we learn from those mistakes. And I think what helped me as well to see and that informed the way I wrote was during lockdown, there were quite a few communities that came together because people felt lost during the, you know, post-George Floyd and didn't know what to say. And, and teachers had questions they wanted to ask, but felt they couldn't because they felt they would get called out. Or So when we had these environments, we came and it was a confidential environment and we were there to share I got to see 
things from a different perspective but there are people that wanted to help but didn't know how to help and they were just like rub it in the headlamp like, what can I do to, to to address some of the things that I'm seeing so it was like okay you've opened my eyes and so I'll, I'll hopefully address some of the concerns you've got but in the way that it's not accusatory you know you've got privilege and do that you're not doing it you know not like that at all because it's not going to help to to make yoga more accessible to, 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 to and, and people are there to help you know there are genuine people that want to help the community definitely and if you're you ask a question that's a little bit tentative and you get shut down it doesn't encourage asking more questions and learning more and ultimately being a better human really as well as a better yoga teacher and we all make mistakes you know I've made mistakes along the way and that you know hopefully the book will address some of those mistakes I made because when I was trying to address communities that I had no experience of I'm sure I made mistakes along the way and I, I'm sure I still will make mistakes but it's how I learn from those mistakes and what I can I can do building upon them. Yeah, absolutely. No, when you're writing, it doesn't sound like you are someone who thinks you know everything. It sounds like you're someone who is really open to always learning. And one thing that I really loved in your book is you actually start with like the black femme roots of the body of the body positive movement, which I don't think we hear enough about. Would you like to share some of that history here? Yeah, so I think the body positive movement has had three iterations. You had it in the, you had it back in the, you know, the suffragettes, <laughs> and then the the body positive movement, as we know, and not many people know, is it started by the 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 black femmes, and it was basically a movement for marginalised people to create spaces for those that were being ignored in society because of their physical experience, and it became part of the fat positive movement in the two merged together so it became an, an act of activism because it became political in that it was about getting equal rights for schooling health and all the stuff that we all take for granted that's very much what it's about but it was accepting yourself for how you were not that you had to conform to you know the, the beauty ideals that we, we we see and have to live with every single day so it was a, a, I suppose a, a form of rebellion against the norm, basically. And especially since there are a lot of trans people who were a part of that initial beginning who would not have seen themselves in media or really outside of like dedicated queer spaces, I really got that it was like an act of defiance just being yourself yeah, and a dangerous thing in the world at that time and sometimes now, unfortunately. Because when you see how bodies were discriminated, you know, to be discriminated based on your size and your colour, you know, so it was able to address that, so that, you know, creating a space where you, you, you got away from all of that, where you were honoured and celebrated for who you were. And so, like, the movement's really grown. Would you like to just share, like, what are some of the benefits of this getting bigger and reaching more people, but also some of the more negative aspects of more and more people wanting to say they're body positive and commercial companies getting on board? I just think that the movement growing, there's a lot more people out there celebrating their bodies. And you see it on social media in so many ways and it's becoming more normalised, but you still have the biases there. But that's what I love about it being out there, that, you know, it's informed yoga having it out there as well because you've got body positive yoga as well. So And to show people that biases shouldn't be there because you look at someone based on their colour or their size doesn't mean your judgment is going to be correct because I see so many people you know that uh, that are curvy and they can do things that I can't do as a person that's deemed as being slim and why should we not all love our bodies it shouldn't be we conform to this rigid beauty ideal and it just hopefully normalizes all body types by being body positive being more accepted and more out there but the others the flip side to it because it's become sort of commercialized is that the people it was created by and for don't feel they belong anymore and there's a small group of people trying to claim it back but you can see that they've made the body positive positive movement all about self-love and it's not necessarily about self-love only and unfortunately you have people that wouldn't be deemed as curvy saying they're body positive or trying to say that they've got body fat but they haven't you know they have a space already and they're trying to encroach into another space that 
should be for people that maybe don't see themselves in the mainstream. So that's one of the flips I've seen. And it just, it's lost its meaning, really, when you see it in the, in the mainstream. So you have the third iteration where everyone is saying they're body positive and it's not. And as you say, Joe, not many, many people know about the background or the history of it. So that, again, is lost. So there's only a few places you Google it, you can get the background. But I don't think a lot of people know who it is. Again, it's been dominated by those that are already accepted in the mainstream what we're seeing as well. Yeah. And like you're saying, like, I get that people who are in a smaller body can still have bad body image and are still bombarded by those messages from the media, but it doesn't necessarily help someone who is from a much more marginalized community to kind of see their bikini Instagram post and, you know, hear about how they've like just got five kgs more to go on their diet and then they can feel good about themselves. Like I feel bad for everyone who doesn't feel good in their own bodies, but it's also like this is a movement that has like a cultural root and a cultural emphasis and I think it's important to learn about that and to honour it. Something that I'm seeing like more as well is also the phrase body neutrality rather than body positivity. Would you like to talk about like what's the difference between those two points of view? So it, depending on you speak to Joe, body positivity could mean self-acceptance, loving yourself for who you are essentially. And at the core is one of the subsets. It's belief in yourself, essentially, as well, is the core of its message, regardless of your shape, your size, or anything like that. And it has a positive view of your physical body, regardless of that. And it involves loving your body for what it is, even if it isn't perfect, according to society's beauty standards. Because it's about, I suppose, again, going against the beauty standards again. But body neutrality is a middle road approach. And it's it's neither loving or hating your body. That's the difference between them. It doesn't mean you have to always love your body by being body neutral, which body positive sometimes alludes to a little bit more. So I hope that answers your question there. Yeah, definitely. And I've seen like another point of view as well of people do not need another source of pressure and expectation and failure in their lives. So to be confronted by this message that you should love yourself when you currently really hate yourself, just getting to that neutral place is a lot more achievable and attainable than going straight to love and positivity. Yeah. And I think, you know, and that's why I love with yoga because, you know, it's about self-acceptance because I think if you accept yourself good or bad, then from that place, you may eventually get to self-love because I find that when I have that in, in, in my classes, that students will come with one expectation of yoga and then you can see how they accept their body and their body showed them how powerful their bodies are and what their bodies can do for them, what we take for granted. And then you see them in the class doing postures that they never thought they could do. And they take that from the yoga mat into their everyday life and they're doing things that they wouldn't, maybe they think, oh, I can't do that because I am I look like this. But they're beginning to be, you know what, hell no, I'll do what I want to do. And it's so nice to see that when they're showing up and they're showing their practice and they're wearing what they want to wear. You know, they're not being limited. And, and you, you know, there's things that come with that you know, the, the body shaming, but, you know, it's nice to see that there's a whole movement and, you know, you've got Lizzo and there's so many other people, they're out there championing, you know, loving their body and showing it's, it's, it's okay to love your body as it is and embracing their bodies. Totally. And like, it doesn't mean that you can't work on getting stronger and feeling like you're doing something loving for your body if, like that's a workout because that can actually be helpful for mental health. It can be helpful for like sleep and physical health. So it's not just about weight loss. There's so many other aspects to movement and feeling good in your body. And I think that's just such a beautiful aspect of accessible yoga and body positive yoga. It's this safe space where people can expand their range of possibilities and usually there's choices along the way. So you also get to have that practice of making decisions that feel right for you in that moment, which is also something we often don't get in our everyday lives. Exactly. And you see it so much, Joe, because a lot of people still won't come to yoga. I remember being at the Om Yoga show one year and and, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, somebody came to the stand and she obviously must have had an interest in yoga. So I, she said, I can't do yoga. I said, yes, you can. She goes, I'm, I can't because of my size. So I was able to get a picture of Jessamine Stanley and show her. And she went, really? And she said, yeah. So, and, and she was, and that just 
challenged her viewpoint of what her body could do. Because if you look at yoga, there's one body type that we see all the time. And it's so good to see that there are people like Jessamine and others out there that are showing that all bodies can do yoga. It doesn't matter. Yoga welcomes everybody. It's us as teachers that sometimes may not do so because of sometimes our limitation, our teaching. And like you said in the beginning, Joe, when we went on teacher training, we didn't maybe teach to diverse bodies because there weren't diverse bodies there. And it's so good to see that there are teachers coming through that are all shape sizes as well. But even sometimes they have body image issues because they feel they don't look like what teachers should look like. Because then you've got what a teacher should look like. So you've got that. But I'm so glad it's not stopping them from coming so that, you know, more people will see someone that looks like them teaching so be welcoming more people into the yoga space. Self-massage can be a wonderful addition to your yoga practice, especially since it's not focused on strength or flexibility. It's really all about getting to know your body and feeling better. We love the Markaloo, which is a set of nesting domes on a wooden base that you can use for self-massage and developing proprioceptive awareness. It's such a great portable and accessible tool that really opens up new movement possibilities. It's a fantastic addition to chair yoga, and since the domes all contain magnets, you can even stick them to your fridge. This is really helpful for anyone who has difficulty getting down on the floor, or anyone who wants a reminder to have a massage during their day. The domes have been designed to support arthritis and peripheral neuropathy, and they look like a beautiful little sculpture. You can use our discount code, MACFLOW, capital M-A-K-F-L-O-W, to get 10% off at markaloo.com and help support the podcast. Yeah, so powerful. And I really appreciate the section in your book on unconscious bias because I think it's so key and I actually haven't experienced learning about this except in a accessible yoga or a trauma-informed training. Would you like to unpack a little bit for maybe people who aren't familiar with that concept? What does unconscious bias mean and how might this play out, say, in a yoga class? Okay. So unconscious, unconscious bias is a, stereotype, a social stereotype that certain groups of people may have about individuals outside of their own conscious awareness. And everyone has unconscious bias because some of it is there to save us imagine you know if we saw a skate a snake even our body would react in a certain way because it's 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 trying to protect us but the way it may play in a in a yoga space is that when someone comes into our yoga space and we may make an assumption based on how they look and that assumption may not be right and sometimes it can be based on size you may look at someone based on their size and assume that they may not have a very good yoga practice and I have yoga friends that are teachers who get consigned to the back of the class because someone's looked at them and thinking that they're complete beginners and that is wrong and you know also a, a bias can be based on some, some the color of someone's skin I know that judgments are made about me based on just someone looking at the color of my skin as a teacher sometimes as well they, they assume I'm a teacher they assume if I'm standing on reception you know front of house waiting to check students in they may not they, they don't think I'm a teacher because, again, it's that imagery. And also the way it may play in class, and I have to teach teachers to look at this, is who do you spotlight in class? So if you get a student to demonstrate a posture, who are you asking to demonstrate the posture? Is it someone that you know has got an, a regular po- posture, practice rather? But what I try and do to change that sometimes, Joe, is that if I have someone that's curvy, I will actually ask that person with the agreement to demonstrate a posture because that will help to bake down some of the biases that students have. Even, you know, students come into classes will have a bias about, an unconscious bias about the teacher. They have an assumption that, you know, it's a two-way thing. We all have it there, but it's, it's what we need to do to become aware of it because we can change those potential biases that we may not be aware of. Yeah, absolutely. They're so ingrained. We, you know, we get all these messages from society all the time that we're not aware of. And a big one that I notice as well, I've seen this with um, other teachers who I've been doing trainings with, is the assumption that someone in a larger body is coming to class for weight loss reasons, when maybe that person has an eating disorder and they're coming to class to learn to love their body just as it is. Yeah, exactly. 
or they just want to come and do the yoga, like how I would go to, you know, if I went to yoga, no one would assume that I'm there for, you know, that I just want to enjoy the yoga practice. So why can't we rent a sanctuary for everybody that's come in there, that they're there for a reason? And we see that all the time. I remember there was, I think it was online, I think Jeevana shared it, that there was a, a, a teacher in the body went to class and the receptionist tried to get them to go into the, the, the next class, the beginner's class, because they didn't think they had a, a they, they could keep up with the class or had the level of practice that was suitable. And not only the teacher had to go for that, but they had the same thing with the teacher as well. And in, at the end of the class, the teacher came up to her and said, oh, was the class OK? And, and you did OK. You did you know, the patronising, you know, that happens maybe when they see that, oh, I've, you've challenged my my viewpoint here. But you know, it, it, it's quite shocking and you get it all the time. And, and, and that's where we need to change. And I'm glad that now there is a language for it because a lot of the time as well in my training, when I was going through my training, there wasn't the language for it, but we had the language now to, to call these things out if we need to and address them. So it's a wider audience understands what we're going through as my lived experience. Definitely. And it's like, just because someone has a different body from you, it doesn't mean they can't just live their life and do something because they enjoy it. Yeah. But even conversely, Joe, I remember I was in class once and, and, and so I've got, I've got, I've got what you should say, I've got long legs. So I was trying to do standing separate forward fold, but I've got very tight hips. And the teacher with a friend would stop the class and said, we're not going to move until Donna opens her legs wider. But because then EI was, I'm deemed as being slim and I should be able to manipulate my body in a certain way. So their bias is working in so many different ways in, in that respect. So, you know, we all get it sometimes. Nice. And I love that you honor all of your teachers and the community in your work. Um, as you just mentioned Jivana Heyman. So when you share that, what you've learned from a particular training or teacher, you're also supporting their work and directing the reader to where they can learn more. The subject matter you're covering is so vast and such so many areas like trauma-informed teaching or working with eating disorders, which really require additional training. So how hard was it to edit down all this knowledge to a reasonable book length? My editors were quite good. They reined me in because I because <laughs> I, I found the process so hard to write that I was writing and editing at the same time, and it was a struggle. But everyone said, "Just write and see what comes out of you." So I think I wrote what I felt was right issues that I was seeing. So eating disorders seem there's a lot of eating disorders. So I thought I w- I would address that because that's something we're seeing a lot in yoga, but. And trauma-informed yoga helped me so much to understand understand so much more. So I shared maybe what I found valuable to me and hope that others would as well. So, And I thought maybe there's another book out there, but I could just touch on these and make reference to these teachers. The teachers that found what I shared valuable could go off and learn more from the teachers that are, are skilled uh, knowledgeable in those areas. But it, it, I think it was that hard. I think in the beginning, we, the outline was very good but as I said I was really reined in quite a bit if I went off too much and I think I could see what I wanted to share because if there was a lot of repeat you could tell what I was passionate about sharing and that hopefully came from the book. Yeah it definitely did and I really loved the multiple viewpoints because I think it again just shows like firstly there's a big global community of people doing this work and everyone has their own point of view and really like that's what this is about learning about other people's point of view so that we can open up this practice to a diversity of different people, not just people exactly like us who think like us. <laughs> yeah, and that's and that's what's so wonderful because when I first started doing yoga, I don't think I'd found my community, but through the internet, I've been able to connect with yourselves, my teachers, which I wouldn't have been able to do if we didn't have that, because I would never maybe have been able to know about them and have access to them. And, and the fact that, you know, we invite teachers over to the UK, but also now I think everyone's changed in their teaching. I think a lot more teachers now are teaching online to a global audience. So you have access to those teachers like we wouldn't have. To. And it's so wonderful to be able to share their teachings to, to other audiences as well. And that's the beauty of it. You know, we're a community and it's good to be able to share other voices. And this is like a technical question, I guess, or an ethical question. 
when you're sharing what you've learned from other people's work and other training courses, like were there concerns about maybe asking permission and how much to share? Like you credit people really thoroughly. And since their quotes are in the book, you've obviously had a conversation with them before sharing. But I think there is this interesting aspect of teaching what we've paid to learn from trainings by other teachers. And some people are actually quite guarded about what they share for free. And the message is, oh, if you want to learn more about that, you need to pay to do my course. <laughs> yeah, I, I think as long as you're not plagiarizing someone's work and you credit them back, I think that negates that. And the fact that you said that I've got the quotes showed that, you know, I actually went out there and actually, because I remember there was one instance where there was Susanna Bakataki, there was something I, I, I think I quote in the book, and I couldn't find it. And I thought, where did I get this from? And I thought, I looked in her book, I couldn't find it in the book. But it's on social media. So I had to, e- to email, I messaged her on DMs in Instagram and said, Sana, what did this come from you? And she said, yeah. So, you know, so once I was able to ensure that I wasn't plagiarizing anyone's stuff, there, and, you know, as you say, it's it showing people that my work is informed by their work and I'm honoring them. Hopefully that they'll see it's a form of flattery. And as I say, I credit them. I didn't take anything and try to claim it. As, as my own I think if you do that then I think there should be no issue but there are you know I know there are people that have their work plagiarized and have no credits so I suppose like you know it's like cultural appropriation where things are taken and there's no credit back to it so being very aware of that as well not to say I'm cultural appropriate, appropriate anything but it's just having that and knowing to honor who the work and give the credit to to those individuals I hope I, I did that yeah absolutely and because most of the people you were speaking to come from a marginalised community and sometimes the intersection of different marginalised identities, there is this messed up expectation that it's their responsibility to educate everyone else for free, whether that's unpaid emotional labour, answering everyone's questions on the internet, or even like presenting at a conference for free as though it's like this awesome opportunity. And there's this tension between giving someone a platform to share their work and their knowledge and to educate others, but also like fairly paying people for their work because that is their livelihood. Yeah. No, and I think I, I, I don't get that so much now, but in the beginning there was so much, especially after George Floyd, the Black Lives Matter. You know, it was like my inbox was full with people wanting to ask questions, but I began to set boundaries. I think that's what helped me to navigate this and not being afraid to say no That and realising that the knowledge I've got, I had to learn that knowledge and quite from somewhere. So the same way others can do the same. So I'm not afraid to say no now and to and to be asked to be paid for my labour. Before I wouldn't, I would have said yes to most things, but it's like, no, I, I can't. You know, I, to, in order to be healthy, you know, to my mental health and my well-being, I have to say no and, and do what resonates with me in, in that respect. But, um, and, you know, I still, if, if, if something resonates with me, I'll give my time for free. But if it doesn't, it's not the norm anymore. I'm, I'm not so much afraid now, actually, to go back. This time, like, should I take, should I say yes or I go back and ask the question? And I say, okay, fine. But I'm not so much afraid before I'd say, okay, I'd assume that uh, because maybe it's like something that's, I want to do, not to expect payment, but as my mum said, you don't ask, you don't get. And and so not to be afraid in that sense anymore. So value your time. I've got to value my worth and coaches have instilled that in me. Value your self-worth. And that's what you have to do as teachers, because there's so much as being teachers that there's expectation that it's for free. It's for free. It should be free. And you feel guilt, your guilt into it. It's like, well, no, no, no. If I may not do it, there might be someone else that may do it, but I certainly have to honour what I've done and and coming from a corporate background I think as well for me it's a little bit easier because you know in in corporate you get paid for what you you do type thing but a lot of teachers don't come from that background there's that conflict there knowing what to do but you know having your boundaries and looking after yourself because if you don't you can burn out and now you've got a book you've written as well so you know if someone sends you one of those unsolicited dms you can just send them the link to your book (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Indeed, I didn't think about you, and that, and that's so true. But you know, but, but if someone's genuinely, you know, and there's times when people genuinely, you know, if it's just a charity or someone, I can help them out and give them my time. I will do so. But the, the amount of requests we get, and it, it can be so much. And somebody rightly said, 
it's not my job to fix everyone or, or inform everybody. I can't do that. And and once they said that to me, it's like, okay, that's a good point. Because before you think you have to give everyone the knowledge because you want the world to be a better place. But it's like, you can't do that. You can't do that. It's not, And it's not only my battle or fight to do so. There are others out there championing the cause as well. And if you want to keep doing what you're doing in a sustainable way, like you can't just work yourself into the ground for free. Like healthy boundaries keeps you healthy. Indeed. And, it, and, it's, and it's good as well having people that are ahead of me ex- doing that exam- um, example, in that for me as well, which is good. So I really enjoyed the section on gender and pronouns in your book and on using inclusive language in class. This was another thing that definitely wasn't covered in my initial teacher training. But I think that It's also something that a lot of teachers are scared to ask about because they don't want to get it wrong, so they just kind of don't address it at all. So I think a book is actually a perfect place to unpack, you know, what kind of language is going to be welcoming for everyone, what kind of language is going to exclude people. Would you like to just share a little bit about some of the changes that we could all make to help everyone feel welcome in class of all genders? Um, to, firstly, not to make any assumptions because we, how somebody presents doesn't mean that's how they want to be to be um, addressed in that respect. So make no assumptions. So one of the first things, uh, and I'm still addressing it, it's, it's so ingrained. I would say guys a lot. Because guys is a very, you know, uh, and, and it's supposed to be a neutral term many years ago, but like everything it evolved, but it's not anymore because it's got masculine connotations. So it's finding something that someone won't be offended by. Uh, uh, you know, like some people say friends, it's fine so you're comfortable or you're all, oh, there's so many. I think I showed a chart and it went ridiculous, but it showed different alternatives in that regard. And, you know, using terms like ladies, you know, you don't know who's in the room or anything like that. Or even when you, if you, if you talk about posture, like chaturanga and say, oh, men should find that easier because they've got muscles. It's like all individuals may find that easy because, you know, because they've got the strength. So being careful about those things and, and using, you know, gendered body you know parts as well in, in in class you know to 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 help with alignment you know use the room maybe as landmarks instead of doing that and even and so it's very important because you don't want to offend anybody and it's so I know it can be mindful but think about what you're saying before you say it and if you think it's got the potential to offend somebody it's best not to say it, you know, and we will we'll make mistakes because the language changes all the time. You think things that were okay to say five years ago may not be okay to say now, you know, even like another one, is it pregnant women, you know, say pregnant people instead. So try and think about some of those, the language, because language is important. It, it can inspire, it can devastate. And gendered language is even more important because now we live in a world where people present in different ways. And that's the beauty of it. But we as teachers, it's our duty to to create a welcoming space and not to offend anybody if we can do so. And language is one of the key ways to do so. And I'm still working on guys as well. That one comes out of my <laughs> mouth now and again. <laughs> a guy jar. Every time I should put some money in the guy jar. <laughs> sort of a swear jar. But it is. And even the other day it came out, it slipped up. But it's it's quite funny. And when I tell my, and it's funny because I all say things like, you know, not gendered language, but language. Again, we say the word just which can be deemed very ableist. And I told my friends in class, and you can, you can see them looking up because they, they catch themselves. I've stopped telling my friends about it anymore because it, it disrupts the flow of their class because they're trying to not say it. So there's so much in terms of language. That is, a, I think, a, a very big topic I cover in the books. I think it's, so, it's very much so important. But again, we're humans. And, but, you know, and to, to be aware of what we're saying, I think, just to be aware of what we're saying, and that will help to make the class as welcoming as possible but as we say things that are okay today to the land may be something we, we don't say anymore and I think as well a big part of it is people actually having the confidence to tell people that this is not okay or that's not my gender or that's not how I'm comfortable being addressed and one thing that I read which I think is a very helpful insight is when someone calls you out on something or just brings something to your awareness rather than saying sorry which then sets it up that they have to go oh that's okay say thank you yeah yeah exactly that as well yeah I think you're right I think when I was in one of my trainings they said if you make a mistake don't always say sorry because it draws more attention to someone may not be aware of it and, you know, in that respect. So it's 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 a minefield we navigate, but I think 
being aware that language is important. A lot of us work, because so it was never addressed in my training. It's only in the trainings that I've done in recent years that I began to realise how important language is and, and to, to understand it a lot more. Yeah. And also like there's the spoken language, but there's things as well. Like if it's possible to have a bathroom that doesn't have a male or a female sign on the door, like a bathroom that everyone can go to. Exactly. But in London, we're seeing a lot more now. I think, you know, we, we become very much aware of this and it's nice to see that happening in some of the yoga, but also mainstream places as well that, it, you know, we, we've been more aware to be, you know, non-gendered in, in our life as much as possible. Yeah, we're lucky. We've only got one bathroom, so we never gendered it, so we didn't have to <laughs> change anything. <laughs> and so one of the other things that I really appreciate about your book is, as well as the philosophy, like you cover a lot of the realities of teaching yoga today. Like there's a really great section on using props in class, but also like marketing and navigating both working within a studio versus hiring out a studio and how you can grow your business ethically. Like it feels like you pulled back the curtain a little bit on what goes on behind the scenes. And it also felt like it really came from your own experiences. Would you like to share a little bit about everything beyond the philosophy behind this practice? Just an easy, quick question. <laughs> I think a lot of it is from my own experience. You know, a lot of it comes through like how I started to market, how I was able to reach groups that were invisible on the yoga space how I was able to to go to where they were like I was able to take the yoga to them but also in the imagery I you know I think for me imagery became a very powerful way to to show but because I think I didn't realize how powerful my image was until I think it was Yoga International about five years ago. I went to teach and it was a, like one of the last classes. And, you, you know, in the UK, it's always raining. It was meant to be summer and it wasn't. I thought, I don't want to be here. I thought, no one's going to turn up. And I was doing the, the, the body positive yoga, but targeting people in larger bodies. But I didn't think about myself as a person of colour, how powerful I was as a, as a person in terms of being visible. So when I went to the club to teach the class, I was so surprised by how many people that came and how many people of colour came. And, and then someone actually turned to me and said, oh, did you realise that class you taught? There was there was quite a few people of colour. And I said, oh, yeah, I realised that. And I still was not dismissive, but didn't realise the impact it was. And at the end, when they said to me, Donna, we came to support you and you need to be more visible, that's when I began to realise that it's not about me, it's about the students and who I can help to get to the yoga mat. And that's why I say, you know, marketing is is so key. And hearing some of the horror stories about people going to classes that were labelled as beginners and they weren't and they put people off. That's why I think when you market, give as much information, information as possible. You know, I even shared that I will say to individuals, you can interview me about my class if you want to, or you can come to my class if you want to and see what it's like. But by talking to me before class, I can talk about any objections they may potentially have and allay any fears but always they get a sense of my energy and that's happened so many times that people have been on the borderline and it's oh well Donna you, you've sold it to me you know and I talk to anyone you know I take yoga really off, the, off the yoga mat I'll talk to anyone about yoga anyone that says I don't like yoga and I'll try to change that viewpoint and and it's successful but that's how you know for me taking yoga off the mat is the most powerful thing as teachers it's we need we it's how we get people into yoga space so marketing for me is the key one and share my experiences as much as possible because I didn't have a clue when I started out how to to change yoga but that experience I'm happy to share with anybody so I hope that answers your question definitely and I've got another question because you've spoken about how you're not necessarily in what most people would define as a larger body and the classes that you teach are aimed at larger people, curvy people. So if you only shared pictures of yourself on the flyer, people might see that and there's a disconnect between how you look and what you're going to, like who else is going to be in that class. What suggestions do you have for people who do want to represent that their classes are for everyone when they are in one particular body type and maybe from one particular cultural background? Like, what do you do? I share diverse images. There's so much on, on social media, but also I will also get the approval of my students as well. So I can use an image in class like that. There's a video I show and it's very 
it's got various individuals it's, it's, it's very diverse and I shared that and you say people say wow so I was very lucky because I've been doing this for quite some time I've got a lot of imagery that I can call to to share on social media but I said the same thing use this diverse imagery out there use them with people's approval because a lot of teachers will allow um, you know other teachers or students will allow to use their image as well but it's so nice to see that there is so so the teaching image is changing and I can see so much diversity on Instagram, on social media myself as well. And I also appreciate that because I don't represent that image all the time, that there are people that won't come to me because they will go to a class that, and I think it, someone says in the book, that they will go to a class with someone that looks like them because they feel they will understand and their body more and understand what their experiences are more. And that's fine. But, you know, we've got so many teachers out there in the world that there's someone that will appeal to everybody. That's why I said teachers, be who you want to be because whoever you are will appeal to somebody. You'll find someone that resonates with you, resonate with your style. So be authentic. And I think as well, the more images that we see that are from a class, not a photo studio of, you know, designer outfits and Photoshop, like just real life people doing this practice, like that helps everyone. Yeah, it does. And it normalizes all body types. And that's the thing. That's what we're working towards that you won't, you know, you, you just, you look at a body and it, a body in a yoga pose. And that's where we're trying to get to say so everyone will come. So if someone might think of something, oh, that's unusual. Or that's not the norm, and that's what we're working towards. We, we know we've we've come some way from when I started, but we still have a long way to go. Nice, and I guess we've got one more question. We asked you this last time, but in the last few years since we spoke to you, and everything that you've learnt in that time, and everything that you've taught and maybe written about, if you could distill it down to one core essence, what do you think that one thing would be? God, that yoga is for everybody. That you know it. It should welcome everybody. And that a lot of what we see now is cyclical. Because when we go back to certain things, we'll see that yoga was always accessible, but it's the knowledge is not there. But you, you, if, you, if you dig back, you see, or even about gender fluidity, that we're seeing a lot of it now, but it's not a new concept. So a lot of things, yoga's, I think, becoming what it, it was meant to be, if, I, if that makes sense. That's what I'm, I'm seeing in that regard. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And actually, this builds on a previous interview with Nishala Joy Davy, and she was saying how a lot of the translations that we read about yoga are from a colonial point of view and from a patriarchal point of view. So we're really getting back to the more true essence of the original text and the original practice by taking away that particular filter and opening up the lens to a whole lot of other different points of view. Yeah, exactly. And I think the key thing for me is, you know, unlearning to relearn. I think that's what has been key for me that, as you, as Joe so eloquently put, that the lens I've learned from was a very westernised lens. But by unlearning going back to in, Indigenous teachings, I'm learning what yoga was about and what it can be. And there's a lot of us that are, are, are creating that now. And a lot of people that want to create that because they're understanding that it's not what it was really about or is about fantastic and thank mm. you for like your wonderful contribution to this discourse with your book and with everything that you share yeah thank you it's been a place yeah I, you know i think for me i just i'm just donna i suppose i just do what i feel called to do i, I tend to go with the flow and, and the path I, how the path unfolds I, I just really go with it and the book became part of that path so i'm interested to see what's going to happen next i don't know so i'm just here Waiting. The launch will be soon, so that's the next thing. That's the only thing I've got planned. But thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for um, yeah speaking with us and for everything you do. And yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> And I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Donna Noble. She's another huge influence on Joe and myself, and she's always a warm and friendly person to speak with. Her book is currently available for pre-order and will probably be available in Australia this November. We'll include a link in our show notes to this and everything else we've spoken about on our website, podcast.flowartist.com. You can also leave a comment there if you like. We'd love to hear from you. You can also find me on Instagram at runlovesyoga and joe at gardenofyoga. 
Our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and is used with permission. Check out gosoul.bandcamp.com. Thank you so, so much for listening. We really appreciate you spending your precious time with us. He aroha nui maokia koto katoa. Big, big love.